there's a, there's a few people who um, haven't been on these things before, haven't been on Ned Talks before. So just a couple of bits about it. It's very relaxed. It's about conversation. It's about topics that are relevant to private client advisors from a range of backgrounds and locations. Uh, and in terms of our speakers today, um, I know a number of you know um, James and also Andy, not, not the same types, but uh, James, founder uh, of Sanctorus and is uh, a, an acclaimed international tax advisor um, and one of the few people that I think can make tax both interesting and digestible, which is no small uh, skill. And then we've got my, one of our very own um, from Nedbank, Andrew Bates, who heads up our Middle East banking operations um, and, and, and quite frankly has lived all around the world. So it's very well placed to give us sort of a bit of a, a bit of a steer on not just Dubai and the UAE, but maybe, you know, just just moving to different juri jurisdictions in general. Uh, in terms of what we're talking about today, I had a big long list, but actually I had a chat with the guys just before we came on. And, and in reality, we're going we're gonna to look at what you need to look at when you're moving to a region, irrelevant of whether it's Dubai or somewhere else, what you need to do when you're in it. And then if you're leaving, what sort of things you need to look at before you leave. I also um, quite like to get a bit of a sort of an insight from both James and Andrew, just, just personally what it's like. Um, Andrew's been there for 12 years, James has been there for two, bit of a change over that time. But I think a lot of us, you know, we, we look after wealthy private clients and, and the, the Dubai and the UAE as an option is coming up more and more. A lot to do with a little bit of sort of political instability here and potential changes of which there's been a lot of chatter in the last couple of days. Um, but for me, going out and speaking to a lot of private client advisors, Dubai is coming up a lot more than it was, say, coming up two, three years ago. Right, I've spoken for way too much. We haven't got much time. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll hand over to James. I don't know if you want to kick it off with with, with your views. Yeah, sure. Um, morning, everyone. So yeah, two years um, in Dubai has gone very, very quickly. But at the same time, it still feels like I'm brand new. And um, I b before moving, I thought I knew the city the emirate the region pretty well um and i sort of knew what to expect but i'm actually still discovering an awful lot about actually living in in dubai in the middle east in the uae undoubtedly a huge number of of misconceptions still um the biggest one is probably the move to dubai and the, the you know the streets are paved with gold you still get a lot of people who think that they're coming to make their fortune, particularly as estate agents. No offense to anybody who is on the call as a successful estate agent, but everybody comes over to do a commission only job, runs out of money and leaves very, very quickly. So actually for, for people who are moving there long term for lifestyle, family, putting their kids through school, um, it can be a really great place to live and that th there has obviously been a perception that dubai is tax free um there's also a bit of sort of uh, i think general confusion over people refer to dubai as a country but it's actually one of seven emirates that makes up the united arab emirates and as a country the uae is very very diverse um, but still people do get, um, a bit of a surprise that we do still have to think about tax. Um, I know, uh, Andrew, you, you're going to touch on uh, sort of moving out and mm. uh, moving back, but things like, for example, people who have the, who have been there a good number of years, a lot of people moved pre statutory residence test for example. And that's one thing that comes up really regularly is that people just aren't up to date on UK tax changes. Um, Cause I think you, when did, when did you move? Andrew, was it 2012? 2012 permanently. Yeah. After uh, five years, five or six years of coming in quarterly, we, we relocated here as a family in 2012 as a family of four, now a family of five. Yeah. 
so again pre SRT yep. and there aren't a there aren't a huge number of tax advisors on the ground so people generally haven't taken advice for a very long time you see a lot of people who are trying to give very well meaning advice um that is very incorrect um but that's particularly for people moving back from the uae to the uk mm. those um, people giving advice is that people uk based or dubai based are giving that advice uh it's it's generally well-meaning expats on facebook groups <laughs> or, yeah. which isn't which isn't renowned for sort of being the best source of of tax advice but in a lot of cases we're, we're sort of going back to basics of residence and srt and what is taxable in the uk and what is not um so is that sort of what you've found as well andy yeah i, I look i think there's some some very basic things that, that people just um miss um unintentionally when they're moving out here they think they're moving out to dubai they've read the headline of it's tax free mm. yes no income tax taken off your salary but uh, there's no capital gains tax but that's pretty much where it stops and if we if we if we focus this conversation on uh uk expatriates coming out to dubai and returning it probably makes the conversation a little easier uh but a number of our clients when they move out may decide that they're uh going to keep the property that they had in the uk and let it out um and think that they live in dubai where there's no income tax and therefore there's no tax upon the rental income depending yeah. on the level of that rental income it, that's generally incorrect uh, and as you said most people here seem to take their tax advice from either an ifa that's trying to sell them a structured product or the 19th hole in the golf course or or anybody that they don't have to pay um you know and, and they, they fall into lots of different trappings um more so as you pointed out when when they're returning um for those people that have created wealth or, or, or made wealth offshore often they may just return home and then let somebody know after the event and they've just took a load of gain back into the uk whereas having a conversation with yourself and people such as yourself could have saved them a lot of time money anguish and heartache um so it's just simple things that that people often overlook and, and generally it's it might be because they're very busy individuals and and structuring their finances or taking tax advice when they believe they've been living in this tax-free environment isn't top of their agenda and i think we saw this more so uh during things like covid when people made knee-jerk or, or, or very quick decisions to leave a country you know we had a couple of clients who, who contacted us and said sorry we've not been in touch or, or responded to email uh, we decided to move back to the uk this not been able to travel we, we weren't going to have it and i said when did you get back please tell me you haven't done this and that and the other. Um, and, you know, we were probably the last people on their mind. Um, but the consequences of, of walking back into the UK uh, and becoming resident, ordinary resident, tax resident, um, could have or did have some severe uh, implications for people. Um, so you got that on the sort of extreme side of it. But some of the basics uh, for when people are moving here, uh, I, I was chatting with some clients the other day uh, who've been referred to me by an existing client because their bank had wrote to them and said, we understand you now live overseas. We can't bank you when you're overseas. And by the way, you've got a mortgage with us. You need to refinance that. And they're like, ah, right. Who do I go to for that? They don't realize that there's, you know, a lot of actions for the actions that they've taken, unintended ones on their part. That, that's a very common one. Um, lots of people that move out from the UK are probably in a, an occupational pension scheme of some sort. That finishes when they move out to the UAE for most people um, because the pensions, as in the true form of pensions, doesn't exist in this region because there isn't the tax benefit that goes with it. And that's often replaced with a loose or weak scheme, sort of the end of service gratuity scheme. And a lot of people just don't make up those years in the pension while they're here. So we're educating people on the effects of trying to sort of make those sort of provisions because they still have a, a life after work to sort of fund um, sit basic steps such as are they going to continue to make voluntary national insurance contributions when they're away? It, it, it's the little things that people often forget when they're moving. They, they, they've took a job. So let's say people are moving to work. They've took a job. They've seen this nice salary in what looks an idyllic place to live. And it's just the little things that then often catch them out or trip them up. 
But when we look at um, who is moving here, there's a lot of people move out here for employment purposes because they're, they're often looking at more lucrative packages so they think they can accelerate their wealth. Some people are moving out here for lifestyle that maybe they've sold a business and, and there's a reason to be out of the UK for a period of time. Sort of the advice that I know you give some of our clients, James. Um, you know, so different people are moving for different reasons, but they'll all have additional things outside of that. We're moving for this reason to consider. And they're often the things that are just overlooked. But then two more minutes from me and I'll, I'll breathe and let people ask me lots <laughs> of questions. But the sort of things that I've, I've found... Um, 12 uh, over 12 years that people still ask you now uh is uh it must be great in dubai but earning all that money tax-free so well it would be if it wasn't 13 pounds a pint um and that's usually followed up by what you can drink in the uae um you know people think it's a, it's a dry country um and that if you do get caught with a drink you're probably going to get your head or something or, or a limb removed um you know it, it uh you know, is it true that you can't walk around with your wife and she has to be covered head to toe? No. So, and, and, you know, there's just lots of little things but that people just get wrong. Um, so on, that, know, on that point, is, is, are there different things in different Emiratis? So that uh, is or is, or is the, uh, doable? Yeah, so not, not so much across the, the, the seven Emirates that make up the UAE. Sorry. Uh, um, so, some, some of them. Um, like Sharjah, one of the Emirates, is is a, a dry state. So uh, I think there's only Sharjah Shooting Club uh, yes. where you where you could go and partake in alcohol. And by the way, just to let you know, I didn't move here just because you could drink. Um, but but yeah, just using this as an example. So yeah, diff the shooting Emirates. range does seem the ideal place to allow people <laughs> to alcohol. What could go wrong? Yeah, but, but um, you know, I think often when people refer to Dubai, they're referring to not just the UAE. They're referring to the, the wider Middle East or the GCC. So yeah. they'll often say things to me like, oh, "I've heard women are allowed to drive in Dubai now." So they've always been able to drive. I think you're getting mixed up with 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 what's just changed in Saudi, mm. uh, you know, because the you know the rest of the world probably report and present largely factually incorrect, but Middle Eastern news, not usually regional specific. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like I say, I've mean, been traveling out here for 18 years, been living here for 12, and the same questions come up all the time: is you know, does your wife have to cover head to toe? Are you allowed to eat in the same restaurant as you are? Are there bars there? Can you drive? Um, and I just think, you know, come and have a look. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been delighted to take questions from anybody as to you know, what is it like living here? Um, what are the do's, don'ts, good, bad and the ugly? If, if anyone indeed has got any questions on it. Yeah, and actually, that's what I might start poking people now, um, because we've got a lot of tax advisors and a lot of people that advise internationals on the on the on the. Yeah, see, Lindsay's getting excited. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought it was at eleven o'clock on a Friday, Lindsay. Um, uh, I'm very pleased you're here. It was not on, so I, I did Pilates by Zoom and finished slightly early so I could join the call. Ah, so. oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but I'm looking at Graham, uh, David, Elizabeth. I, I know all of you have clients that 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 that, 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 that I want to know if Dubai is coming up, or is it just me that's that's um, that's experienced that uh, that it, it seems like it's becoming ever increasingly more popular as a, as a potential destination for not only the individuals, but their companies as well. I've only had one client go to Dubai. Okay. They're going to Portugal just before they close the um, entry requirements at the end of December. And now they've extended it. So if you went, if you applied by the end of 23, so I've got about three people going to Portugal. Okay. All right. Because it's Europe. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. only person who's gone to Dubai is an Indian client of mine who, you know, already own property there. So Okay. Uh -huh. There is a there is a there is a a, a big non resident Indian population. Twenty eight percent of the population is uh, high net worth uh, non resident Indians. So they're actually the largest population in the UAE. Yeah. 28% okay. of the total population. Or Correct. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. so, so you've got 28% um, non-resident Indian, followed by 12% high net worth Pakistani, 
uh, around 10% local indigenous Emiratis. So that clears up 50% straight away. And then the other 50% is, uh, you know, a melting pot of me and everyone else. Uh, you know, a large set of Western expatriates. There's still quite a lot of people from the US here because of the gold, uh, sorry, not the gold, uh, the liquid gold uh, industries that populate these regions. Yeah. Um, you know, and we are still one of the only banks that do actually onboard Americans, actually, because we, we were full factor compliant as soon as factor sort of became a thing. And, uh, and a lot of Americans struggled to find banking or lending solutions when they leave their, their country of residence. They are one of the only people, though, who still pay income tax here because of the dual tax uh, side in the US just, just going off piece. But, yeah, it's, it's a real melting pot of people in, in the Middle East. Uh, where we're seeing more people at the moment coming into Dubai from is since the uh, lifting of restrictions in, in, in China, uh, which was probably the last people to take off the COVID handbrake. Uh, my wife works in real estate out here uh, and she's saying uh, uh, increasingly more of the high net worth buyers are from mainland China. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, obviously when the UAE... Um, didn't place sanctions on on uh, Russia during the Russia Ukraine conflict. There mm -hmm. were a lot of uh, Russians and people from the CIS regions found their way here. That seems to have slowed down. Whether or not they're all here that were coming or not, and whether they remain once oh. conflict settles, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But but at, at the moment, it seems to be people coming from the Asian nations, which which are the new wave of people coming in. Maybe that's to do with the fact that. Um, Win casinos have announced that they're opening a casino in Russell Kamer, which again, you'd think casinos in the Middle East, when would that ever be a thing? Yeah. People, you can drink, you can drink in gamble, you can enjoy port products if that's of your persuasion. Um, so yeah, they, it's it's a real melting pot of, of different cultures that come here. Oh, interesting. Uh, great. I noticed you were going to say something, then you stopped. Um, the US part is a big part of what you do. So I imagine what Andrew was saying just then maybe struck a chord. Um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was going to say the same as Lindsay that I, we, I don't get many of my clients inquiring about Dubai or going there because predominantly internationally is US clients who are based here. Um, and, but my question, I was going to ask the guys the question about how many Americans are out there, which Andrew's effectively answered that there are some out there, but we do have that problem that the US have to pay tax no matter where they are, regardless of their the mm. domestic tax where they're resident. So so that's why yeah, I was going to jump in on that point, but Andrew's very succinctly answered it already. That's good. I'll go back and drink my coffee. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, new, the new wave of Americans that we've, that we've seen here at the moment uh, are, are largely in the hedge fund sector. Yeah. Uh, it seems to have been a, a big move out of, out of people either from London, uh, actually the hedge funds themselves have actually moved over here and, and the people have come with them or they've opened up operations here. Uh, but a large drive out of the US as well. Um, so going back to when I first sort of started frequenting the regions 18 plus years ago, anybody that you saw or largely saw for, from the US was in that gas and oil sort of industry. Now it does seem to be more along those financial services related things. But but again, whilst they might pay tax on their income, there is um, good pl tax planning that can be done for US people, I'm sure, whether it's foreign grant to trusts or, or, or the likes. I'm talking wearable my pay grade now to to help people um structure themselves but the the other interesting thing on the us side is even emiratis born and bred out here will often find themselves subject to some sort of us exposure be it their children um going to harvard or wherever it is or stay or deciding to stay in the us um you know these people may have set up uh, trust in the past and now beneficiaries have moved out to these regions uh, so there's lots of things around sort of US connotations or, or again I do a lot of work in Asia uh, just slightly off piece but um, the amount of people from Asia that did what was it the EB35 visa scheme into the US um, so you know they, they, they were born in mainland China or, or born in one of the Asian nations but the US passport holders uh, and now they're subject to all of the US taxes so you know there's Lots of it, often unintended consequences. Yeah. Are born of people seeking just a different citizenship or, or, or passport. Uh, and again, they're often ill-advised when seeking that additional um, passport or, or, or residency or citizenship uh, on the taxation 
um, rules going forward that, that, that could affect him. The, the the passport one is interesting, actually, in particular, because um, so I have a I have a case on at the minute. Someone wants advice on um, the UK, the, the uh, tax implications of setting up a foundation. Um, so trusts, trusts exist as a concept, but um, foundations in particular are uh, popular and continuing to gain popularity generally treated like a discretionary trust for, for UK purposes. Um, and they've got about 30 million um, dollars worth that, that they want to put into a foundation. Um, the issue is, is that they're UK domiciled and they've already done it and have taken now tax advice after establishing the foundation with a with a law firm, with a you know, a, with a, a a local, very good law firm, um, so they now have a very significant issue because, of course, if you're still domiciled in the UK, um, you're still going to be subject to UK IHT on your personal estate, um, on settling a trust. That trust's going to be relevant property, and so have a six percent charge every ten years exit charges on the way out mm. and it's a and this is not unique to the, the to the region by by any stretch and everyone will have seen it is um well two things one dual residence is a brand new concept for some people particularly when the un, until march last year the uae didn't have a statutory definition of residence and so there were because it, it was never really needed and so people thought that, okay, I need to enter the UAE once every six months to be a resident. It's like, yes, you need to enter once every six months to maintain your residence visa, but that one doesn't make you a tax resident and two certainly doesn't make you non-resident elsewhere. Oh, so there's a confusion between actually just your visa and your, your residence yeah. from a tax perspective. And that's obviously what people stumble over. Massively yeah. so. Okay. Would you and say then, that's probably the most common mistake that people make, especially sort of a high net worth that's quite mobile, globally speaking? It's certainly up there. Yeah, without a doubt. I think for a lot of people, the concept of dual residence is uh, is is pretty new and startling when you talk to them. But then the probably the the more problematic one, I would say, that we see a lot of, unfortunately is the confusion between residence and domicile. Yeah. So that's so you can be resident in well there are the there are clients who think that residence is the same as domicile use the words interchangeably and say they're non UK domiciled when they mean actually they're non UK resident. Um but also where it it's perhaps slightly different I suppose from certain other countries is that currently there is no concept in the uae of permanent residence or um foreigners being able to get um emirati citizenship for example other than by very very rare exceptions um and you have to be issued your your the only way you can get citizenship is for it to be issued by uh the the rulers courts um, and it's very, very rare. So then it sort of begs the question, well, if, if you might have been living in the UAE for 20, 25, 30, 40 years, can you actually say that you have lost your UK domicile of origin and acquired a UK domicile of choice in a country where you you can't attain a a permanent resident status, never mind citizenship. Mm. There are longer term residence programs now. So golden visas, for example, that give you 10 year residence renewable. But that's how do you get one of those? Sorry, what how, what's how do you get a golden visa? So if you buy um property uh worth at least two million dirhams, which is uh do maths in my head, what less than yeah it's about 400 and a bit thousand 
um, pounds. So not a particularly high benchmark. Um, if you have a uh, an executive level position um, in a company and a monthly salary of 30,000 dirhams, um, uh, and then various others. So um, there's a, a humanitarian route to recognize people who've um, been undertaking humanitarian work. There's a creative arts route um, to be recognized for success in the creative arts. I guess not dissimilar from the sort of US exceptional talent style mm -hmm. visa um, in some ways. But that 10 year golden visa, even though you can renew it every year, it's not permanent. It, it oh. isn't, there's no concept of permanent residence. So really, can you have an intention to remain there permanently or indefinitely? Well, you probably can, but that doesn't mean you actually have the ability to do so. Yeah. And so arguing that you have, um, uh, that, that you have acquired a domicile of choice in the UAE, I think is currently probably almost impossible. That's interesting. Unless you, unless you have, uh, unless you, uh, you know, unless you uh, marry an Emirati or something. But and do you have that conversation regularly with people, or is it just a sort of a, a, every now and then? All the time. All the time. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. people do a look a lot at um, trust planning, foundation planning, that sort of thing. It's pushed very heavily as well by um, there's a, there's a within professional services. I think there's far more of a sales culture than there is probably in the uk and so foundations in particular are sold as being the you know sort of the, the panacea to cure all all ills um it's not a trust so that's fantastic but if you're uk domiciled then generally the uk will treat it as a discretionary trust mm. so that is one that comes up all the time yeah but not even as far as you know, trusts and foundations. It's just the concept of still being subject to IHT on your worldwide assets. Yeah. And the idea of needing to have a will in the UK, a will in the UAE, um, the, there wasn't the option previously um, for, for this and succession was governed by um, Sharia um, law. Um, but now non-Muslims can register a, um, a, a, a will that will apply the succession law of your home country. Okay. Andy, you were going to chip in there. Um... Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say the the sales culture side, it, it sort of hit the nail on the head. I know lots of people in this uh, region that will be running around saying, take out a DIFC will, um, along the lines of what James has just said there, that'll be governed by the rules of your own country. Do a DOM questionnaire. If you bought a house here, and you haven't got any assets in the UK anymore, you know, we think that you'll be classed as non-DOM. Well, who's the we? Um, you know, and but you, you still, I mean, 33 years I've been doing this uh, type of work now at various levels in every, every uh, continent with the exception of Antarctica I've lived or worked on. And you still see the same questions come up all the time of, yeah, but who'd know? I haven't got anything there. Who, who'd tell the tax man? You know, yeah. it's just denial of putting in proper structure in place or accepting the fact that you are likely to be subject to this. It, 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 you know, the, the, the old ostrich in the head approach seems to be the cheapest one. And therefore, let's let's just act naive. Um, no, yeah, for the best. It's um, astounding how many people just think I'm out the UK. Who would know if I died? I'm not going to tell them. I haven't got any assets there. Oh, and this guy set me up a... Uh, well, I did a Don questionnaire. I've done a letter of wishes. I'm, I'm fine. I've been told I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, then you 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 just go and do your thing. And it's yeah. the idea of you. We think you're not domiciled in the UK. Yeah. So where are you domiciled? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that doesn't matter. You're just not domiciled in the UK anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Which is that that isn't a thing. <laughs> Guys, I'm conscious we've gone over slightly by two minutes. Um, that was a. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, Andrew and James for coming on. That was really interesting. I'm not thinking of, of moving anywhere, but I found it interesting because there was a lot of myths that were dispelled for someone that hasn't actually even looked into it, let alone someone that actually does. So um, really helpful. I'm probably going to try and put some points together because I think it would be really useful for me to send a bullet point um, 
uh, email to everyone that's on here and also copy in uh, Andrew and James's details if you don't know them so you can reach out and, and ask them any questions you need to. Before we go, Andrew and James, do you have anything you'd like to add or are there any questions from... I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm fine for time. So if there's okay. any questions... Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. If you're fine for time, stay on. Just, just, um, just I'm just conscious that... that, that, that it's, uh, um, I'll answer anything and generally to the best of my ability. Brilliant. Any questions? The, the one bit I'd just like to add very briefly, if I can as well, sorry, is around corporate tax. So um, big topic, corporate tax was introduced from June last year. So now companies are uh, generally, by default, a, a UAE company will be within the scope of corporate tax. 9% um, on profits above about $100,000 various exceptions there's the concept of free zones um sort of designated uh tax favored areas but even they have a lot of conditions to meet as well so if you do have anyone with a business in the uae and again this is uae wide so dubai is probably the the biggest one but abu dhabi as well um in particular so if anyone does have either a company um, that's in the UAE or if they are resident in the UAE but have a UK company, um, if it is UAE managed and controlled, there's still a, uh, a UAE CT obligation. Um, every company has to register regardless of whether or not they are um, uh, actually liable to CT in the first place. And the first registration deadlines are coming up at the end of May. So I would just put that out there as a general comment to companies. There's probably CT considerations as well. Brilliant. Quick question that came in from, um, from, from Sam. What's your stance on repaying UK student loans manually once living and working in Dubai versus waiting for it to be cleared? I'd just do what everyone else does when it comes to domicile, pretend they don't exist. Um, you know, and <laughs> change your name, change your address, and hope they don't find you. <laughs> that is not the official route at all. <laughs> uh, James. In practice, it is in practice. In practice, anyone with a student loan will be conscious when they move to the UAE, that they think they don't have an obligation to repay it. Very safe answer. Well done. That's probably is. That, that's probably what I would say. Yeah. Good. And then I'll, 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 I'll just leave you, I'll leave you with one, one comment that I got the uh, this morning, which, which made, made me laugh. I was with a client this morning, and he said to me, saying, your third son was born here. Or my first son, but my third child. I said, uh, yes. He said, why didn't you go to the UK to have him? I said, well, the hospitals here are fine. He said, yeah, but now he's going to be subject to national service in the UAE. I said, he's not, because he's not a citizen. Just because he's born here doesn't and will not make him a citizen. And this yeah. guy's lived here, and he's a law firm partner, by the way, yeah. in, in these regions for over 20-something years. But it's, again, it's just very simple but common misconceptions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Now, interesting as well, because people, I've got friends that, that moved there and they're only going to go for two or three years. They're still there 12 years later. Yeah. And, um, so it's a real sort of, if people think that's an actual thing, that, surely that's a concern. Hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Guys, we have massively overrun. Huge thank you, James and Andrew. That was really, really insightful. And I've had loads of really nice comments from, from people as well saying really helpful. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there and uh, enjoy the rest of your Fridays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Nice Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.